Okay, so my name is um, Danilo, or Dan Chiarloni, and I'm here to present to you uh, Sandboxing Your Sandbox, Leveraging Hypervisors for WebAssembly Security. Now, before I get started, uh, can I just get a quick show of hands for who was here for my talk yesterday at Rust Global? Is there anyone in the room that was here? No? Okay, perfect. Um, this talk, will, the idea is we'll build upon that one, so if anyone was here for that, I was just gonna preface that you'll probably see some repeated slides. Um, but yeah, if, uh, if not, this will all be new and novel and exciting. Okay, so now I'm sure that this title in itself uh, can spawn a million questions in everybody's minds, but I wanna start by answering a very simple question of um, who are you listening to? So as you saw in the previous slide, my name is Dan, but other than that, I also work at Microsoft with a project called Hyperlight. Now Hyperlight is a project where we leverage virtual machine managers or hypervisors to execute untrusted or third-party code safely. Um, if you're into social media or you know, GitHub, um, those are my handles right there. If you have any questions uh, that you wanna ask that maybe we can't get to right now, that would be a good place to reach me. So, you may think that, you know, with uh, working with a uh, Hyperlight, very security-driven project, what I'm saying here is that, you know, I'm something of a security expert myself. Um, but no, that's not the case. In fact, I made my very first contribution to Hyperlight and consequently security only about one year ago. So what I'm trying to get across here is that even if you yourself are not something of a security expert, that's okay because I've been there um, and I am there and hopefully this will be a comprehensive talk and we can sort of learn together. Cool. So now what is this talk about? And before I tell you directly, I wanna show you a little clip from um, Microsoft Build with uh, Azure CTO Mark Rusinovich when he introduced the project that I work on, Hyperlight. It's um, one of the things that, in, that inspired this talk in the first place. So I feel like it gives us a little bit of context. Now, the way it's that we keep uh, our infrastructure very efficient is by tightly packing customers together. Either virtual machines, and that technology has been around for a long time. More recently, within the last decade, we've introduced hypervisor-based isolation for containers with, uh, with Hyper-V. So you can see that in the middle. And those address you know, traditional OS-based applications containerized applications, but we really see a place for user-defined functions, small functions that will execute either in the network network data plane, like on a front door service, or as a user-defined function sitting inside of a storage service. But we need to strongly isolate them as well. And WASM, while it has a great sandboxing technology and it's really got a great ecosystem around it, lacks the kind of isolation that we require for running a public cloud. So we've been. Okay, so I want to focus on that very last statement from Mark Russ, saying that Wasm, while it has a great sandboxing technology and has really got a great ecosystem around it, lacks the kind of isolation that we require for running a public cloud. That's what this talk is about. It's answering why. Why is Wasm's isolation sometimes not enough? And particularly in our use case of running a public cloud. Um, I don't know how many people here were, f um, were here listening to Nick uh, Fitzgerald's talk, you know, mentioned how much uh, wasn't time goes through fuzzing and whatnot, so why is that still not enough for us? And um, perhaps maybe more importantly than that is discussing how did we solve it and how did we address that we make um, it be enough for running a public cloud and still utilizing WASM. Okay, so today's agenda is, we'll start off with an overview of WASM security then we'll split it into two. We'll discuss binary security and we'll discuss host security. And in the middle, we'll have an aside um, for what role language choice plays in generating secure WASM. This was an aside that I had here for uh, my Rust global talk. As you can imagine, we'll discuss Rust, but I figure it will still be interesting to uh, point out. So I left it in. All right, and lastly, uh, we'll finish the talk talking about strategies for improving your uh, WebAssembly security. 
Okay, so let's begin with the very first item in our agenda, overview of WASM security, binary security. So what comes to mind usually when I say WASM security? Whenever I ask people this question, two words pop up the most. The first one is sandboxing, right? Um, WASM is completely isolated from its host environment, and that's resource isolation. And so any functionalities that it does have to use have to be explicitly stated. That's the number one thing that people mention. And the second one is also memory isolation with uh, WebAssembly's um, linear memory, you know, preventing out-of-bounds accesses and accessing through a host. Those are the two main things. And um, those are great. Those are great things that we definitely do need. But is that all we need? And to answer this question, I want to kind of flip it upside down. The snippet that you're seeing here is a snippet from the WebAssembly specification itself. Um, it discuss, uh, it introduces buffer overflows, and it says that something, uh, mitigations that, we, that exist for preventing buffer overflows in native binaries, such as um, data execution prevention, DEP, and stack smashing protection, are not needed by WebAssembly. So to answer that question, perhaps, I figure, like I said, to look at it in an inverse way. Is this something that we don't need? You know, and play around with this statement. But before we get, uh, we dive too much deeper into that, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page with what stack smashing protection, or also known as stackinaries, are. So here on, I believe, your left, we have a very simple C++ program um, or function called vulnerability. It takes in a string, and we have a buffer of length eight, and we do a string copy onto it. Um, as you can probably guess by the name of function vuln vulnerability, and also by the code, because it's very simple. Um, it's very easy to get a buffer overflow there, right? You pass in a string that's very, very long, and it will go over the buffer. Now, <clears throat> in native binaries, what we have is that the compiler will insert prolog code that will run with each execution to generate some bytes, i.e. the stack canary, um, that will allow us to detect buffer overflows. So the stack will look somewhat like this, right? In a native binary, we have a buffer, we have a stack canary, and then we have things like the return address or so forth. And so if the buffer does get um, overflowed, it will corrupt the stack canary, which is something that we knew at the beginning of our program. And so we know it's been uh, corrupted, and we know we were suffering of a stack smashing attack. Now, back to the question. Is this something that we don't need in WebAssembly? And rather than telling you, I figured we could look at a demo. Uh, this is a demo. Uh, we'll be displaying a vulnerability in the libpng library. This is a library written in C. Uh, the vulnerability, as you can see, is an out-of-bounds write in libpng, an 8.8 .8 vulnerability. Um, and this is a demo I got actually from a, a paper from uh, Daniel Lehman saying, uh, everything old is new, again, binary security of WebAssembly. And as you can probably guess by the name, this is something that we don't have in native binaries, but that perhaps is made new again. And I want to spoil my own demo, but we'll, we'll take a look. So close this real quick, and we'll open. Um, VS Code. All right. So the example that I have here is we have the C++ program. And what it's doing is it's going to use the libpng library. Uh, libpng is png utilities, right? And in this case, we're utilizing a function, uh, pnm to png, which is where that vulnerability exists. And as you can probably guess, we will we'll convert a right, pnm file to a png file. And we're being I'll say pretty naive, right, to display the vulnerability here. What we're doing is we have, we're writing directly to the browser, so this will display it there. We have this image tag, right, we call convert, and then we append that directly onto our document. Now, let's, uh, let's take a look at how that works, and we'll see a good example. So let me run Python, server.py, cool. So now we're serving this application, and I should say, so this is a plus plus program utilizing inscription. We compile it to Wasm, and then we have it uh, running like that. And uh, here we go. So I'll show you a good example first. I have a, uh, where is it, repos, should be Rust, yeah, inputs. This is monarch.pnm, so it's a monarch butterfly, and if everything works, we get a beautiful motor butterfly. So that was a PNM file, successfully converted to PNG. You know, that means our users are behaving and the program is behaving as expected. However, what if we provide something, what if we're malicious, right? What if we provide something that it's intended to break the program? 
we can provide this. Now, I don't know how many people here know P and, P and M files, but this looks very different from a normal one, which in VS Code looks somewhat like this. So what we're doing here is we're performing a, a stack to heap overflow attack. And so we write a bunch of garbage up until we reach the point in the heap or the linear memory that we're concerned with, and then we can sort of, you know, um, mess up with that point in memory. And as you'll see here, we have uh, some, some fun planned. So now let's upload that file. I'll reload the page, choose file, and I will upload our exploit. And lo and behold, we get a cross-site scripting attack. Now again, we didn't have that anywhere in our C++ code, right? All this does is it converts the image and put it to there. But with that exploit file, what we did have is we had this script alert. And we have it even more. If we click OK, we see that we got pwned. So um, yeah, this can be pretty catastrophic, right? And there's a reason why that's an 8.8 .8 vulnerability. Because I mean, this is a pretty simple example, right? But say we had a social network, whatever. Someone could post in our behalf, right? So if uh, someone's having, using Wasm, um, there in someone posts um, um, on Twitter or X or whatever people call it nowadays. Cool. So that is um, a vulnerability in binary security. But how does that look with native binaries, right? I told you that the title of the paper was everything old is new again, and now, like I asked, how does this look with native binaries? This looks somewhat like this. I don't have the example with uh, libpng, but I brought back that example that we had prior with that vulnerability function we see in the string and passing in a string that's too big. We see that we do get a stack smashing detected. So we do corrupt our stack uh, canary, and this just doesn't exist with uh, normal C or C++ or native binaries while it does exist with WebAssembly now. So, why does the Wasm specification say that we don't need SSP, right? Like, are they lying to us? And uh, no, no, not really. And that's because in Wasm, we have two types of memory. We have managed memory and we have unmanaged memory. Managed memory is our code space, while unmanaged memory, memory is our linear memory or heap or whatever you want to call it. And those two are completely disjointed. So normal things that people will use buffer overflows to do, like you know, corrupting your own execution environment, this will not happen with WebAssembly. You can't have any go-tos or jump to arbitrary locations in memory because that's in uh, your management in your code space. So to quote uh, Dan Goldman, Luke Wagner, people that you might have seen uh, around the conference, at worst, a buggy or exploited WebAssembly program can make a mess of the data in its own memory. This is from another paper, bringing the web up to speed with WebAssembly. Cool. But as we've seen, this can still be sometimes pretty bad with that 8.8 .8 vulnerability that's made new again in WebAssembly. But enough to speak. How can we counteract this? And I'll go deeper into this later in the talk, as you saw in our agenda. Our item two is strategies for improving WASM security. But uh, that's the time in the agenda where we're talking about that side of language choice. So I want to say libpng, like I mentioned, is coded in C, right? And memory unsafe languages will still generate memory unsafe WASM modules. They will not fix your code for you. So you still have to do your due diligence to ensure that your modules are not vulnerable to malicious input. People can still mess up your memory. Um, I didn't show it here, but say you have, you know, one vuln function and you have another vuln function, um, they look the same or somewhat similar. You could even corrupt other stack frames and go and mess up another function. So um, we can use Rust, and that's one option. You know, it's a memory safe language. And to keep it simple and to maintain the, um, our theme of uh, buffer overflows, I have a very, very, very simple example where on the left, we have a C++ program. Um, we have an array with a uh, length five, and we write on the fifth element. And that in C++ does compile. Obviously, you can get warnings, right? And um, it even runs, and you can have undefined behavior. While in Rust, it doesn't even compile. And the point that I'm trying to get across with that very simple example is that with Rust's memory safety guarantees, um, like you know, being, having to be explicit about unsafe code 
and even the ownership model, it's way harder to fall into common pitfalls that you would fall with uh, C or C++. <clears throat> but let's put that in the back of our minds for a second because we'll get into strategies for improving WASM security later on in the talk. Right now, it's time to talk about host security. So is this the world if WASM had stack canaries? Is that all there is to it? No. Previously, we looked at a module that is vulnerable to malicious input. But what if the module in itself is malicious, right? If, what if we, the ones that are running the module, have malicious intent? Um, that is the concern of host security, which is, right, that's a beautifully stated here, the ability and fortification of the environment against WASM modules with negative intent. So this adds a whole new attack vector on top of things, right, um, that we have to be concerned about because now we also have to be concerned with where we run our code. Like, what if the runtime allows us to break out of sandbox or linear memory? Um, things, as you can probably guess, can get pretty bad because we'll have access to the host. Um, but again, rather than me telling you, I wanna show you a demo. This time, it's a demo from um, Wasm time. This is another um, out of bounds write on x86 and 64. This is a 9.9 .9 vulnerability, so pretty much as bad as it gets. Um, and I'll say thanks to Alex Frickton for helping me put this together. Cool, so let's take a look. Now, I am on a Mac M1, so I have to go to my VM, on my dev box. Okay, so here we are, and uh, we have two Watt files. The very first one, um, all that we're doing is we have this load function that will load um, somewhat arbitrary looking piece of memory. Actually, let me make that a little bit bigger. Is that better? Um, somewhat arbitrary piece of uh, memory, but that's related to how the vulnerability works. Um, and then in B, and I just wanna point out, all we do is we have this function that calls load, right? It's not modifying its memory in any other way. So technically, A's memory should be all zeroed out. But we have B. B will import A, again, right? And every functionality has to be explicitly imported. It, like, a, like A, it sets up its memory, and we have a function called trigger, which will call A's function, again, with a, an input that's related to how the vulnerability works. But other than that, it's also setting something in its own memory. It's setting that value 42 there. So, What we're gonna do is now we're gonna run this, and okay, thankfully I have the code here, uh, the, the um, command. We're running wasm time run, pulling allocator. What this, do, what did the, this does is that it will put um, the two modules side by side. Um, so we have, we're aware of how the memory layout is gonna look like, and we preload A and then we call B and we call a function in B, trigger bug. So again, A doesn't have anything in its memory. With A calling, with B calling A, that trigger bug we should get nothing, we should get a zero. However, we get 42. That's pretty bad, right? We have one module breaking out of its sandbox, accessing another module, and getting hold of its, its memory. And now, again, this is very much crafted to display the vulnerability, right? We have the polling allocator putting the two modules side by side. But if you think about, say, an embedded um, example, right, where we have sort of <clears throat> linear memory or not linear memory, um, restricted memory and things will, are very tightly packed together, it's very easy to grab a hold of uh, your embedded host and who knows, maybe run even a syscall. And, and that's the reason why we have uh, that 9.9 .9 vulnerability there. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go back to our example or to our slides. So now we're reaching um, the final point on our agenda for strategies for improving WASM security, right? We displayed a binary vulnerability, we displayed a host vulnerability. If binary vulnerabilities can sometimes even leak into host vulnerabilities, so we, uh, we have an idea of the landscape and how things look like there. But what can we do to fix all this? The strategy that we're proposing in this talk is security in layers. What does that mean? This is where we grab Rust that we put in the back of our minds right at the beginning and we bring it back out because Rust is the very first layer that we can add, a memory safe language, which can go a pretty long way. On top of that, we're gonna layer Wasm. You know, it will provide us with resource and memory isolation, but as we've seen, 
It can still have problems, it can still have bugs. So we need a third item there. Now, as you can probably guess by the title of the talk, this is where we leverage hypervisors for WebAssembly security. And that's where we bring in harder virtualization or virtual machine managers, right? So what do hypervisors bring to the table? But before that, I just wanna say, we're adding hypervisors on top, right, to address the fact that humans are fallible, right, and we can still have issues, we can still have bugs, but no solution is perfect. In the same way that we have bugs in wasm time or whatever runtime we wanna use, uh, we can still have bugs in here. The whole point of security in layers is to increase the hurdles that an attacker has to overcome to reach an issue. So we're decreasing the attack surface. Okay, now let's do address that question. What do hypervisors bring to the table? The principle behind VMMs is running multiple VMs under one physical host, right? So something, so things will look somewhat like this. We have a physical host, we have a memory safe, Rust, Wasm app. On top of that, we have our Wasm sandbox and linear memory. And on top of that, we have our VM. And what that brings, first and foremost, is deep isolation, right? So if a Wasm vulnerability, binary vulnerability that leaked into a host vulnerability causes a problem, or even a Wasm runtime has a bug, everything or any damage that it causes will be restricted to that VM. So it doesn't touch anything outside of that. That's one thing. The next one is resource control. That is the capability to halt execution if an app is taking too many resources. So um, something modern hypervisors allow, um, give you, and so if, say, a program is hogging, you can stop it. And lastly, again, another feature of modern hypervisors is snapshotting and rollback. So if we do have a security incident, but we had a previous state that we're happy with, we can always roll back to it to uh, our snapshot or rollback. Okay. So now I wanna finish off with uh, sort of coming full circle and showing the demo from, um, from Mark Russ again, the demo they showed at uh, MS Build displaying how we're using uh, Hyperlight with, uh, to, uh, to answer that question or, or case study here. Let's go see just how awesome this is. This is one of my favorite demos here. So here I've got, I'm gonna show you, I've got uh, running on a Linux machine. Linux DOM zero is what we call Linux as the host partition for Hyper-V, and you can see Microsoft Hypervisor there. If I take a look at the amount of free RAM on this system, you can see it's, or the used RAM, it's got 1.1 gigabyte used. Now I'm gonna kick off a script that's gonna launch 2,000 micro VMs. And it did it, and you can see it did it in less than two seconds. I've got 2,000 micro sandboxes running on this VM. And if I go take a look at how much memory I've consumed, each one of those is just about 300 megabytes in size. So tiny, able to handle user-defined function. Now I'm gonna have, make some function calls just to show you that this is kind of performance that's close to just calling another function across a process. But I'm actually calling into a, a, hyper, a, a virtual machine. And you can see the latency was about 250 microseconds. And as far as programming models, we wanna make it really easy for people to create these. So here's a Blazor app, which is a website that says hello and prints a request count, which is a static variable. And if I launch this, there it is, running on plain vanilla OS. And if I do refreshes, every time I refresh, I'm gonna see the request count go up because that's a static variable that's increasing. So let's say that I want to strongly isolate that code. I'm going to use the Hyperlight isolator. And it's as easy as invoking that chunk of code and giving it to Hyperlight to create a sand, put it in a sandbox. And now, each time I call invoke, a new micro VM is going to be created from scratch, which means none of these are going to share any state with any other. There it is running WASM. And if I do refreshes now, that count stays the same, which is because each one of those is a fresh micro VM. So that's the kind of programming model that we're creating for this thing. Oh, 
everything back on. So what just happened is that we had, you know, our WebAssembly module, um, at the time module right now, it could be a component, right, um, running on top of your, um, your host OS and your hardware, and that was about it. But what we did is we thinly wrapped within a hypervisor isolated micro VM. So we're adding that layer on top to provide extra um, isolation. And that allowed us to, run, to have 2,000 micro VMs in under two seconds, where each micro VM is about 300 megabytes in size, and also capable of making 50,000 function calls with an average response time of around 250 <coughs> microseconds. So that was the big challenge there, right? We, we don't just wanna add another layer on top of Wasm, say just you know, a normal VM that has a full OS and then lose everything that Wasm has that's interesting. Um, we wanna have a thin layer, just that micro VM that maintains Wasm benefits, but also provides an extra layer of security on top. Now, and also while keeping a very simple um, and easy to use programming model with that invoke, you know, that has um, lamb, that, like that lambda function that creates a brand new VM for um, each, um, each request, right? That one-to-one -one relationship between user-defined functions and VMs and Wasm, all hugging each other. Okay, so now before I open up for uh, questions, just wanna do a quick um, recap of what we did today. We, one, start off with an overview of Wasm security, right? We discuss things that people usually think about with sandboxes and linear memories. Next, we look at uh, binary security and we looked at a vulnerability there. Then we looked at, at host uh, security and a vulnerability there. And we saw how security in layers is our proposed solution to sort of counteract this and remedy bugs that can exist in different layers of the stack. And then we showed uh, at the end our case study Microsoft's approach to address this with um, Hyperlite and saw sort of the challenges of maintaining Wasm's benefits while also um, adding more security on top of things. And um, that is where I end. Any questions? Please go ahead. So there's no network stack there. We're just speaking with a VM as if it was um, like a normal function call. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, that's a good question. So we're using sort of the term micro VM sort of loosely here, and that's sort of used around sort of literature to describe a myriad of different things. But uh, for our case, we have this micro VM or sandbox, and that does not have an OS. So yeah, Wasm was running even without an OS in that case. So what are you running yeah, so you may think, right, how are you, how are you even run, handling Wasm, right? What, how can you have a system interface if you have no system? And uh, the, the idea there is that we, obviously we have some sort of smokes and mirrors, right? Um, but the idea is that we have, so say, we had a printf function, right? That printf function is actually routed towards uh, your hypervisor function, your host function. Um, in that case was host print, I think we call it. And that prints within um, the hypervisor host that you can implement. And uh, we have different implementations we have for Hyperlight, we leverage uh, KVM, we leverage Hyper-V, Hyper-V for Linux, um, and uh, so it depends on the hypervisor as well. It functions uh, host there. Please, hi. Can you say that again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a little bit of um, we'll add a penalty because we are going inside of the VM with uh, guests and function calls. Um, so the guests will call onto the host. That's one barrier that we have to cross. And then the, the host also has to reply to the guests. 
and we can get sort of exceptions right everywhere in the stack. So say a host gets an exception, a guest gets an exception, and handling that uh, creates the, the overhead that you saw. Please. Uh, Yeah, so we fully intend to use this for production. We're discussing it internally to utilize for um, Azure front door, so our functions uh, servicing. But we're also planning on um, open sourcing this. We have a, a very hand wavy uh, timeline for an open sourcing this, and I can discuss with you um, after in, um, in the hall. But yeah, definitely for production and um, moving towards that. And hopefully, if things work out, um, open sourcing very soon. Yeah, we had another question, or? You answered it with Oh, with open source? Yeah. yeah. All right, lots of good questions, please go ahead. Can you say that again, yeah? Yeah, there's still quite a lot of benchmarking work that I think we have to do to sort of see and compare bench, uh, our performance with, I think, others. There's also similar projects, right, from uh, AWS and, um, and Google, like Firecracker and Gvisor, that sort of somewhat uh, target similar things. So we, we definitely have work to do uh, to compare there. Um, but yeah, I, it, I feel like it's inevitable that we're going to get um, increased size and also decreased um, speed by a little bit. But the goal really is to continue and try and decrease that to get closer to the benefits that uh, Wasm still provides with the added uh, security. Yeah, please. So we have 300 megs, 300 megs per uh, micro VM. And the total there, I think we spun up 2,000 uh, micro VMs. And it, uh, well, I, I forget the, the, what it's displayed in the video, but I think we went from 1.1 um, gigs to 4.1, something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if I made the math wrong, but you can probably correct me there. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, even better. <laughs> yeah, so you can, well, obviously we didn't get to display it here, but uh, with Hyperlight, you can completely define your memory configuration. You can define how much uh, memory you'll get on top, so you could over-provision. And, uh, and have more over the, the minimum bare, uh, bare memory that it does use. All right, any more questions? Joe? So does the binary vulnerability that I displayed in the beginning escape the sandbox? That's your question? Yeah. It doesn't. No, it doesn't, I don't, I don't believe it could escape in that sense of messing up your host. All that it's doing really, it's messing up its own memory, right? So we have, we have management, we have code space, and we have unmanaged memory, so you know, your heap or your, your linear memory, and that's what is messing up, because we have structures that are set there, and like I mentioned in another example, we could even corrupt different stack frames, right? So you have one buffer, you could corrupt the other buffer, but that's all in, in your own um, linear memory. The only problem, Yeah, I mean, one thing that it does add, you, you can have, right, is if you write a bad program that's easily exploitable, buffer overflows, that's still going to display with your OSM, awesome, and that's one of the reasons for perhaps using Rust. Um, but yeah, yeah, so that's correct. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I haven't gotten to play around much with uh, vetting and also fuzzing. Um, Mixed talk was actually quite interesting because I think uh, there's a lot of work that we can do with fuzzing and also vetting for uh, even Hyperlight with uh, WASM modules there. Even WASM's myth generating a bunch of uh, WASM modules for testing things could also be pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah another question? Yeah, so <clears throat> the idea there, right, is to target the multi-tenant. So you have one function, one VM, uh, but we have vCPUs, right, that are uh, specific to your sandbox. And um, so those will be one-to-one -one, one relations. All right, any, any other questions? Okay, if not, I think that is the end.